this Pentecost, drawing on the work of Walter Wink, I want to take you on a short tour through the biblical references to homosexuality, see what conclusions we may draw, and ask ourselves what the Spirit might be saying to the church. Some references that have been advanced as pertinent to homosexuality are in fact irrelevant. One is the attempted gang rape in Sodom. This was a case of heterosexual males intent on humiliating strangers and has nothing to do with genuine love expressed between consenting adults. Likewise, Deuteronomy 23 must be pruned from the list since it most likely refers to a heterosexual prostitute. Several other texts are ambiguous. So putting these texts to the side, we are left with three references, all of which unequivocally condemn homosexual behavior. Two from the book of Leviticus and one from the book of Romans. The Hebrew pre-scientific understanding was that male semen contained the whole of nascent life and women provided only the incubating space. Hence the spilling of semen for any non-creative purpose was considered tantamount to murder. In addition, when a man acted like a woman sexually, male dignity was considered degraded. Culturally, homosexual acts were considered pagan and not Jewish. Whatever the rationale, however, Levitical texts are clear. Persons committing such acts are to be executed. Romans 1 also unambiguously condemns homosexual behavior. Paul seemed to assume that those he condemned were heterosexuals who were acting contrary to their nature, leaving their regular sexual orientation behind. Paul believed that everyone was straight. He had no concept of orientation. And likewise, the relationships Paul describes are not relationships between consenting adults who are faithfully committed to each other. And Paul believes that homosexual behavior is contrary to nature, whereas we have learned that it's manifested by a wide variety of species, especially, but not solely, under the pressure of overpopulation. We cannot, of course, decide human ethical conduct solely on the basis of animal behavior or the human sciences. But Paul is arguing from nature, and new knowledge of what is natural is therefore relevant. Nevertheless, the Bible quite clearly takes a negative view of homosexual activity in those few instances where it's mentioned at all. But this conclusion does not solve the problem of interpretation, for there are other sexual attitudes, practices, and restrictions that are normative in Scripture but which we no longer accept as normative today. These include forbidding intercourse during menstruation, executing people for adultery, executing women for having sex before marriage. Note, women, not men. Polygamy, concubinage. Polygamy and concubinage were both regularly practiced in the Old Testament and neither are condemned in the New. One form of polygamy was a Leverite marriage. When a married man in Israel died childless, his widow was to have intercourse with each of his brothers in turn until she bore a male heir. I think we would be shocked to find anyone engaging in such behavior today. The law of Moses allowed for divorce. Jesus categorically forbids it. Yet many Christians in clear violation of a command of Jesus have been divorced. Why then does the church ordain divorcees 
but not homosexuals. What makes one so much a greater sin than the other, especially considering the fact that Jesus never even mentioned homosexuality? The Old Testament regarded celibacy as abnormal, and 1 Timothy 4 calls compulsory celibacy a heresy. Yet our Anglican Church demands celibacy for homosexual priests, whether they have a vocation for celibacy or not. Others argue that since God made men and women for each other in order to be fruitful and multiply, homosexuals reject God's intent in creation. But this would mean that childless couples, single persons, Catholic priests and nuns, not to mention St. Paul and Jesus, would be in clear violation of God's intent. These cases are relevant to our attitude toward the authority of Scripture. They're not cultic prohibitions about eating shellfish or wearing two types of cloth at the same time that are clearly superseded in Christianity. No, these are rules about sexual behavior and they fall within the moral commandments of the Bible. Clearly, we regard certain rules, especially in the Old Testament, as no longer binding. What's our principle of selection here? Why do we appeal to proof texts in scripture in the case of homosexuality alone when we are perfectly free to disagree with scripture regarding most other sexual practices? If we insist on placing ourselves under the old law, as St. Paul reminds us, we are obligated to keep every commandment of that law. But if Christ is the end of the law, if we have been freed from the law to serve, not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit, then all these biblical sexual norms come under the authority and liberty of the Spirit. Now, sexual norms are necessary in any society, but as Christians, we must critique them by the love ethic exemplified by Jesus. Defining such a love ethic is not complicated. It is non-exploitative, hence no sexual exploitation of children, no using of another to their loss. It does not dominate, hence no patriarchal treatment of women. It's responsible, mutual, caring, and loving. To quote St. Augustine, love God and do as you please. Approach from the point of view of love rather than law, the issue of homosexuality is transformed. Now the question is not what the scripture command, but what does the spirit say to the churches now in the light of scripture, tradition, theology, and yes, psychology, genetics, anthropology, and biology. We can't continue to build ethics on the basis of bad science. In a little remembered statement, Jesus said, why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? Such sovereign freedom strikes terror in the hearts of many Christians. They would rather be under law and be told what is right. 